We are here in the small park that is at the heart of the village of Nunen. Today is the 20th of September 2022, which means that precisely 78 years ago, Private Webster, along with two of his squad mates, was firing from those upper floor windows of the houses behind me, shooting right over our heads in a desperate attempt to keep the German counterattack at bay. Ultimately, they would fail. Easy Company was driven from this village, suffering some fatal casualties. In this second episode of our three-part series, where we follow in Private Webster's footsteps during Operation Market Garden, we will explore what exactly went wrong here at the village of Nunen, precisely 78 years ago today. When we left Webster at the end of part one, he was enjoying a hero's welcome in the city of Eindhoven on the 18th of September. The previous day, Webster, along with over 6,500 men of the 101st Airborne Division, had jumped into the Southern Netherlands as part of Operation Market Garden. In part one, we followed in his exact footsteps from the landing fields and into the streets of Somme. We saw his encounter with a German machine gun and how their objective, the vital bridge over the Wilhelmina Canal, was blown up at the last second. After this initial setback, Webster and his regiment marched on Eindhoven the next day and captured the city with relative ease. They were welcomed as liberators by a jubilant crowd and soon linked up with the British 30th Corps. Their objective complete, it seemed to Webster and the men of the 506th Regiment that they could sit back and enjoy these celebrations in Eindhoven as the British tanks rolled on through to Arnhem and beyond into Germany. Their optimism was to be short-lived, however. Reports of fierce German resistance, of the kind the Allies had last seen in Normandy, were coming in throughout the market garden sector. The Germans had recovered from their summer defeats and were now jumping at the opportunity to punish the careless planning of Operation Market Garden. The biggest signs of trouble were coming from the north. The 82nd Airborne Division at Nijmegen had failed to capture the massive bridge over the Waal River and was being stretched thin by German counterattacks against their drop zones. Even with the help of British tanks, it would take almost two full days of bitter street fighting and a daring river crossing until the bridge finally fell in Allied hands. All the way north at Arnhem, the British 1st Airborne Division had jumped into a hornet's nest. Barred from their objectives and driven in by fierce German counterattacks, the isolated British were fighting for their very survival. Only a single battalion had managed to reach the Arnhem Bridge and would hold on to it valiantly for days, preventing the Germans from reinforcing their defense in Nijmegen. Down south in the relative quiet of the 101st sector, trouble was also brewing. The rapid advance of 30th Corps over the airborne carpet, coupled with the slow advance of 12th and 8th Corps on the flanks, molded Market Garden into a peculiar shape. There was a wide base of three cores at the bottom, but a narrow stem in the center where 30th Corps stretched out from Eindhoven to Nijmegen along a single two-lane road. It was an irresistible target for the Germans. If they could sever the thin corridor at its southernmost point, they would trap some of the best allied units in a great cauldron. The Wilhelmina Canal at Sun where a bailey bridge carried the full weight of 30th Corps, was an obvious choke point for the Germans to pinch. Already to the west of Somme, near the town of Best, bitter fighting between German reinforcements and men of the 502nd Regiment had been going on since day one. On the 19th, an even bigger threat came in from the east, right where Webster's 2nd Battalion was holding the line. Unbeknownst to the Americans, one of the strongest German formations to oppose Market Garden was gathering on their flank, the 107th Panzerbrigade, a fresh, full-strength armored brigade sent to strike the American landing fields at Somme. Armored brigades were a recent German development, first conceived in July 1944 as a more efficient way to organize armor on the Eastern Front where the Red Army had shown itself very capable of smashing great gaps in the German lines, but remained lumbering and uncoordinated when it came to exploiting these breakthroughs with mobile forces. The Germans found that Soviet armor drives could be halted 
if not outright destroyed, if there was an armored reserve available to counterattack with. So, instead of concentrating Germany's comparatively small tank fleet into a few large divisions, a greater number of smaller brigades were needed. They would serve as mobile reserves, lying in wait to counter the next Soviet breakthrough using speed, surprise and superior machines. Despite this solid, theoretical foundation, most armored brigades ended up on the Western Front, where they faced conditions much less suited to their intended role. The 107th under Major von Maltzan was one of the first armored brigades to be formed. It drew manpower and equipment from training units and the remains of a shattered mechanized division in occupied Poland. From July to September, von Maltzan grafted his men and machines into a unit that closely matched its paper organization. The brigade possessed tremendous tank killing power, thanks to its armored battalion. It fielded 36 formidable Panther tanks organized in three companies, supplemented by an anti-tank company of 11 Yacht Panzer tank destroyers. Both machines had thick, frontal armor and a high-velocity 75mm gun capable of cutting through most Allied armor with ease. A company of armored combat engineers in half tracks assisted the tanks in getting over rough terrain, while four Flakpanzer self-propelled anti-aircraft guns shooted it from air attack. Balancing out this tank-heavy force was the brigade's other half, its armored infantry battalion. It fielded five companies of half-track mounted infantry, supported by self-propelled mortars and infantry support guns. When the 107th set out for the Western Front on the 16th of September, it numbered over 2,000 men, 36 Panther tanks, 11 Jagdpanzer tank destroyers, and more than 150 half-tracks of various types. Behind the impressive numbers lay some fundamental shortcomings, however. For one, the training period had been way too brief and was plagued by equipment sabotage. Another downside was the brigade's lack of organic artillery, as it was streamlined for mobile tank-on-tank -tank engagements, not combined arms assaults against fortified positions. Worst of all was the brigade's chaotic and piecemeal deployment to the front. While originally envisioned for the Eastern Front, the 107th was sent west, first to Lorraine, then to Aachen, only to be rerouted last minute on the 17th of September to deal with the sudden airborne landings in the Netherlands. After a confusing train ride, the brigade's leading elements disembarked on the 18th near the Dutch-German border in the towns of Venlo and Roermond still 50 kilometers east of the American landing fields. Von Meltzan pleaded for time so his brigade could fully deploy, but higher headquarters overruled his request. The tanks of 30th Corps had by now linked up with the American paratroopers and were racing north over the airborne carpet. Time was of the essence. An attack had to be launched on the 19th of September. Reluctantly, von Maltzan sent out the first companies of tanks and infantry on the morning of the 19th. As they passed through Helmond, they were reinforced by a battalion of replacement Fallschirmjäger and together they set out to the west, into the unknown. As the German armor closed in on the corridor, the 101st Airborne found itself dangerously overstretched. Bad weather had hampered the arrival of glider reinforcements. Those that did make it, were quickly committed to the fighting at best. This left very few reserves available to defend the Bailey Bridge at Son and the divisional command post right next to it. There could have been no better target for a German armored raid, but von Maltzan hesitated. His flanks were open and his single supply line unguarded. Vast allied armored formations were on the loose, paratroopers could be anywhere, and the local resistance was growing bolder. Already they were passing through villages filled with Dutch flags and orange banners. Instead of doubling down on the element of surprise and blitzing Son right away, von Maltzan spent most of the afternoon of the 19th consolidating his small force and scouting ahead. The central crossroads village of Nunen was chosen as the brigade's logistical base, while von Maltzan himself moved on to the hamlet of Nederwetten to establish his forward command post. Reconnaissance half-tracks soon probed up and down the flanks, looking for roads and bridges that could take the weight of the massive panther tanks. 
their reports didn't fill von Mozan with confidence. It quickly became apparent that the local terrain did not favor his heavy mechanized force. Looking at this aerial photograph from May 1944, we can clearly see why. The camera is facing east. In the bottom left corner, Son and the bridge over the Wilhelmina Canal are visible. This canal stretches to the east, where it connects to the Zuid-Willemsvaart. The city of Helmond can be seen in the distance, with its bridge over the canal being the sole lifeline of the German armored brigade. Further south, another canal juts out to the west again, connecting to the city of Eindhoven. Its large, urban sprawl occupies the bottom right corner. This suburb here is Tongeren, where Webster and the 2nd Battalion are holding the line. In the middle of the triangle between Son, Eindhoven and Helmond lies the crossroads village of Nunen, the central node in von Maltzahn's attack. This road here is the Allied Corridor, the lifeline of 30th Corps. The greatest obstacle to the German tanks was the winding Dommel River, which formed a natural flank guard for the corridor. Only a few bridges spanned it, all of them too weak for the massive Panther tanks. Striking north across the Wilhelmina Canal wasn't an option either, as the Germans had blown all the secondary bridges in the days leading up to Market Garden. Only the newly constructed Bailey Bridge at Son offered passage north. This left Full Maltzan with just one unattractive option, seizing the Bailey Bridge by squeezing his tanks over the narrow southern canal bank where a culvert spanned the Dommel River. It was a horrible place for tanks to be, but he had no other choice. As the sun was setting on the 19th, he ordered the attack. Over on the Allied side, the first indications that a German armored force was gathering on their flank had started filtering in earlier that day. Dutch resistance was passing on alarming reports of hundreds of German tanks rolling through Helmond and heading west in the direction of the landing fields. General Taylor immediately ordered a reconnaissance action to investigate the rumors. This brings us back to Webster, who was dug in on the eastern outskirts of Eindhoven, thoroughly enjoying what seemed like a quiet day. Things quickly changed in the afternoon, as Webster and the rest of 2nd Battalion were suddenly marched off to the east. The rumor was that they were going to Helmond, but no one really knew why. For hours they marched at a blistering pace without breaks. Webster cursed the headquarters men, who were keeping all the captured German cars and horse-drawn wagons for themselves, while he had to carry boxes of machine gun ammunition by hand. Even more infuriating to him was that they were kept in the dark about the objective. So when the column finally approached Helmond and then suddenly turned around, Webster was livid. Without so much as a break, they were marching back again at an even higher pace. Only later did Webster learn that they had nearly stumbled into the German armored brigade, and how lucky the lightly armed paratroopers had been to slip away unnoticed. As the exhausted men of 2nd Battalion returned to Eindhoven, they witnessed a shocking sight. The deep rumbling of airplane engines passed over their heads and continued west, towards the city. Illumination flares lit up the horizon, and Webster could hear the distant whistle of bombs. The German Luftwaffe, in one of its rare appearances this late in the war, had launched a bombing raid against the city center. For half an hour, Eindhoven trembled. When it was over, collapsed buildings blocked the narrow streets and fires raged uncontrollably, setting off ammunition and fuel trucks. The civilians in Eindhoven, who had surprised Webster with a hero's welcome the previous day, suffered 227 people killed and over 800 wounded. Adding to the terror of that night was the first German attack on Son. A task force of Panther tanks and the replacement Fallschirmjäger had reached the Bailey Bridge just as it grew dark. Things looked bleak for the small American garrison, as the German tanks destroyed traffic on the bridge and shelled the 101st Divisional Headquarters. The German force was pinching both the juggler and the nervous system of Market Garden, but they failed to push through their attack. The American defenders held their ground and pinned down the second-rate German infantry, leaving the tanks exposed on the narrow canal bank. 
when a hastily brought up anti-tangun scored a devastating hit on the weak side armor of the lead tank, the German raiding force retreated back into the night. Standing in the rubble of his headquarters, it was clear to General Taylor that he had a serious threat on his eastern flank. Fortunately, two battalion-sized British armored units had been placed under his command to help parry the German thrusts. Some tank squadrons were immediately ordered to Somme to help bolster the defense of the bridge, while others were kept south in Eindhoven. Taylor wouldn't passively wait for the next German strike. He suspected Nunen to be the concentration point of the German brigade and ordered a reconnaissance in force to be carried out the next day from the direction of Eindhoven. Easy Company, having just returned from their grueling night march, was picked for the mission, together with B Squadron of the British 44th Royal Tank Regiment. As the orders for the attack were passed down, Easy Company had a brief moment of rest on the edge of a burning Eindhoven. Webster describes the night as follows. While the fires crackled and popped and flared up, we stopped east of the city and dug into the backyards. We settled down for the night to the sound of the flames and the British armored columns rattling north. At dawn the next day, the sound of clanking squeaking tracks and deep rumbling engines got louder and louder as a column of Sherman tanks pulled up beside their position in the early morning mist. The British tankers had an air of readiness about them that made Webster shiver. Something big was about to happen, but as usual Webster was left in the dark. General Taylor may have ordered Colonel Sink to conduct a reconnaissance in force, but by the time the order reached Webster, it was reduced to a simple ride these tanks till you're hit and then start fighting. After a hasty breakfast of apples and captured German rations, Easy Company mounted the tanks. Webster's first platoon was at the head of the column. With half a squad per Sherman, this meant first and second squads occupied the first four vehicles, with Webster, Raider, Wiseman, Miller, Pace, Lyle and Massaconi riding on the fifth Sherman and the rest of third squad on the sixth. Part of the company likely traveled by foot, as Easy counted nearly 200 men, while B Squadron only had 16 Shermans. At 9.30 the column jolted forward. Webster, like many paratroopers, felt uneasy working with tanks. Their nosy approach was hard to miss and they drew artillery fire like magnets. They were in direct opposition to the stealthy, hit-and-run ethos of the airborne that Webster so strongly identified with. Working with the British and their formality and rigid command structure further annoyed Webster. So being crowded together on the back of a tall, British crewed Sherman tank, while driving down a raised road through wide open fields made Webster incredibly nervous. We jolted forward, 20 yards behind the fourth tank. The sun came out and the mist began to dissipate, but I felt cold and tense. I put my bayonet on and knelt behind the turret where I could see everything, have some protection and still be ready to jump off at the first shot. Aloof in his turret, the tank commander nodded to us but made no effort to chat. None of us was very talkative. The air was quite clear now and we made a lovely target as we clattered along the raised road into the open country. As Easy Company set out on its flanking attack, the main effort was being fought to the north of them at Somme. Already before sunrise, German Fallschirmjäger were in fierce combat with American glidermen who had hastily dug in south of the vital Bailey Bridge. A tank battle was now developing in the early morning mist as German Panther tanks were exchanging shots with British Cromwells and Shermans. Webster must not have heard the distant booming of the tank guns, or perhaps his nerves were drowning out the noise. Take it easy, Webb, Wiseman grinned, noticing my nervousness. Perfectly relaxed and self-confident, he sat beside me with his back to the turret. I laughed without taking my eyes off the road and flat fields ahead. Pace stood nearby and Lyle and Massaconi were ready with the machine gun. Lyle had already draped a belt of 30 caliber over his shoulders. I took two hand grenades out of my pockets and hooked them onto my suspenders. The air smelled very clean and cool and country fresh. I loved the open country. We swung north with the sun on our right quarter.
Do you think we'll get hit? Miller said. He was always curious about what might happen. That's what they told us, right till you're hit. He nodded and gulped. The seventh man aboard? He had been put on as an ammo bearer for the machine gun, which Raider liked to have up front. I don't like it any more than you do, I said. Men were sitting ducks. They could pick us off in a minute. At 10.30, the column crossed the Dommel River at Opwetten. As they drove through the tiny hamlet, they passed a British scout car hidden behind the last house. The crew was looking north through their binoculars. The raised road to Nunen stretched out ahead of them, with open fields on either side, only broken by the occasional farmhouse or stretch of poplar trees. In the distance, Webster could see a large church tower illuminated by the bright morning sun. Where's Nunen? he shouted to one of the scouts as they drove past. Straight ahead of you, mate, was the answer, followed by an ominous warning. Jerry. The tanks proceeded as before, traveling down the road in single file with the infantry holding on tight. Webster must have felt as if he was stuck in a conveyor belt, with nowhere to go and no way to stop it. They were about halfway between Opwetten and Nunen, when the dreadful anticipation finally turned into action. It was down this road, which you can see running behind me, that Webster, along with the rest of the Easy Company, was riding on top of Sherman tanks of B Squadron of the 44th Royal Tank Regiment, heading towards the village of Nunen. And it was just up the road from here, slightly to the north, that they had their first encounter with the German defenders. And this encounter Webster describes in some detail in his memoirs, which I will now quote. An encounter which happened precisely 78 years ago, just up the road from here. To quote Webster. When we were halfway to the village, Jack Matthews, a lively, witty rifleman in the first squad, began to yell and point to the right. Hey, look over there, he shouted. Crowd tank, crowd tank. The column stopped and all turrets swung to the right. Less than 300 yards away, parallel to our course, a large yellow-brown German half-track was slithering through the brush like some evil beast. We jumped off the tanks and ran for the roadside ditches. The British opened fire. The first shell was short. It hit the ground in a cloud of dust and skipping like a stone on water, smashed into the side of the half-track. The other shells hit it square. The half-track stopped and a handful of men jumped out. Men on that side of the road began to shoot at them. Without waiting for orders, we moved down the ditches toward Nunen. The first and third squads were on the left, the second and mortar squads on the right. The tanks stayed behind to finish off the half-track. Those were the opening shots of the Battle of Nunen, which happened precisely 78 years ago, just up the road from here. It was just before midday, and Easy Company had struck the southern flank of the German armored brigade. General Taylor's suspicion was proven correct. Nunen was a key note in the German attack on Somme, and it was appropriately defended. The two half-tracks were likely a security outpost that was pulling back to Nunen after spotting the approaching column. The British tankers mistakenly reported them as Panzer IV tanks, so they may have been the so-called Stummel, a half-track equipped with a 75mm infantry support gun in a limited reverse mounting. One of them was hit in the fuel tank and ignited into a blazing wreck. Nevertheless, they had fulfilled their purpose as a security screen. The booming of the tank guns and the crackling of small arms fire put the Germans in Nunen on high alert. They would be ready and waiting. What followed was a very confusing battle. So before diving back down to Webster's point of view, it is best to first take a step back and reconstruct the bigger picture. Doing so finally brings us to the elephant in the room, Band of Brothers. The 1992 book by historian Stephen Ambrose, but especially the 2001 television series, have been monumental in shaping the popular perception of Easy Company, the people in it like Webster, and their battles, in particular Nunen. Up until now, references to the show have been deliberately kept to a minimum, 
to give Webster's writings space to stand on their own. But now that we have reached Noonan, a brief analysis is in order, because Band of Brothers is simply inseparable from the battle that took place here. Before Ambrose wrote Band of Brothers, the fight at Noonan was an obscure company-sized action that barely made it into the history books. The sector of the 101st Airborne Division tends to be one of the most overlooked parts of Market Garden, and the few histories that do focus on this area only briefly mention the Noonan engagement, if at all. Rendezvous with Destiny, which to this day remains the preeminent history of the Screaming Eagles, dedicates one paragraph to the engagement, describing it as a reconnaissance action that turned into an indecisive tank infantry battle, ultimately ending in a withdrawal. This all changed in 1992 with the publication of Band of Brothers, a book solely dedicated to the story of Easy Company. Four pages suddenly lifted Noonan from obscurity. The 2001 television show then went a step further by using the battle as the centerpiece of the episode on Market Garden. By compressing events from different times and places, it created a spectacular action scene that put Noonan on the map alongside Karantan and Hagunau, but at the cost of historical accuracy. Such artistic liberties can be forgiven for the show, but the problem is that the original book by Stephen Ambrose is not without flaws either. Band of Brothers is what is called an oral history, meaning it is based primarily on first-hand accounts, gathered through interviews and correspondence decades after the facts. These can be great sources of historical knowledge, as long as the historian critically molds the eyewitness accounts into a framework of established facts based on supporting sources. This is where Band of Brothers shows its shortcomings. Veteran statements are frequently taken at face value, even if they are at odds with each other or other sources. One secondary source that Ambrose occasionally notes is the excellent Rendezvous with Destiny, yet he still makes factual errors that could have been rectified by checking this work. Especially the four pages that deal with Noonan contain fundamental errors regarding the date, location and units involved. Band of Brothers offers some great and colorful insight into the social dynamics within a parachute company, but its patchwork of distant memories is not well suited for the recreation of a specific battle, and unfortunately for Noonan, this leaves us with little else. Still, by merging together the most credible parts of Band of Brothers, memoirs from Easy Company veterans, Webster's writings, the accounts of local residents and secondary sources, it is possible to piece together a basic reconstruction of what happened at Noonan. So before diving back down to Webster's perspective, here is an overview of what likely happened. Most of the sources agree that the thick of the fighting happened on the Opwetten Noonan road, just south of the village. It was here that the head of the column came under intense German fire from three directions, in what some veterans describe as a semi-circle or half-moon defense. This happened simultaneously or shortly after the engagement with the two German half-tracks. Some veterans claim Easy Company passed beyond Noonan before getting hit, but they almost certainly confuse Noonan with Opwetten. Infrastructure improvements from the 1970s ensure that almost nothing remains of this location today, but from the eyewitness descriptions we get the following impression of what the train was like. The main road was slightly raised with drainage ditches on either side. To the right of it lay the Fink farm, surrounded by more ditches and hedgerows. To the left of the road was an open field that was slightly elevated. This rise, together with the farm buildings, hedgerows and ditches, provided the cover and concealment that Easy Company was pinned down in for most of the afternoon. First and second platoon were leading the column and took the full brunt of the fire as they passed the Fink farm. Lieutenant Compton of second platoon wrote that they came under machine gun fire from multiple directions and scrambled for cover in a farmyard next to the road. Given his description, this is almost certainly the Fink farm. As Compton was rallying his men, he was hit by a machine gun round and had to be evacuated. German fire soon caused more casualties and pinned down most of the company. Still, the direct front seems to have been somewhat safe, as the buildings there restricted the German fuel of fire. 
Small teams from 1st and 2nd platoon, Webster among them, used this to their advantage to gain a foothold inside southern Nunen. Very little is known of what 3rd platoon was doing. Company commander Winters wrote in his memoirs that he had the habit of holding them back in reserve, so they may have been somewhere down the road closer to Opwetten. The bulk of the British armour is also hard to pinpoint. The lead two Shermans were destroyed on the road next to the Fink farmhouse by German tank fire, but when and how exactly this happened is debated among the sources. After a few hours, the Germans organized a counterattack supported by mortar fire that pushed Easy Company back to Opwetten. Another company of paratroopers with a squadron of British tanks renewed the attack late in the afternoon, but it quickly stagnated and was aborted as it grew dark. The Allies retreated back to Eindhoven for the night, leaving Nunen in German hands. Speaking of the Germans, we know even less from their perspective. The big picture is that the 107th Brigade had occupied Nunen the previous day and was using it as a logistical base for their thrust towards the Somme Bridge. It is therefore fair to assume that it must have contained rear echelon services, such as workshops, aid stations and fuel dumps, and perhaps some reserve forces. Nunen also served as the southwestern flank of the brigade, and as such had to be defended. This brings us to the forces that directly opposed Easy Company on the outskirts of the village. Some of the best insight we can get is from local residents who were behind the German lines. The most detailed account is written by Jan van Bakel, who was 16 years old at the time. On the morning of the 20th, just before the battle, he very accurately places two tanks on the southern outskirts of the village. One stood in the front yard of his own home, another was positioned at the Bex farm to the west. The crews had dug their tanks into the gardens and camouflaged them with branches. Their turrets were facing southwest, in anticipation of an allied attack from the Eindhoven direction. Jan van Bakel later heard from his parents that they were caught in a crossfire as they were fleeing from Nunen to the southeast. Based on the angle to the road and the need for concealment, this fire was likely coming from a tank positioned at the old cemetery. Taken together, these three positions fit in perfectly with the semicircle defense that the Easy Company veterans describe. Adding validity to this account is the German armor organization of the time. While the exact platoon layout that the 107th used is unknown, it is certain that it fueled companies of 11 tanks each. Given this number, it makes the most sense that these would use the reduced late war platoon strength of 3 tanks instead of the typical 5. 3 platoons of 3 tanks each, plus the 2 tanks of the company HQ, gives us the 11 tank total. This would mean that the southern edge of Nunen was defended by a single platoon of three Panther tanks spread out in a semicircle position with their fields of fire converging on the Opwetten Nunen Road. Much of the battlefield is unrecognizable today as the village has grown significantly. Fortunately, we have some exceptional photographs that were taken by Jan van Bakel from the top of the Nunen church tower in 1953. Not much had changed by then and many of the buildings and roads that featured in the battle can be seen clearly. Starting to the southwest, we can identify Eindhoven by its church towers here. On the 20th, the city would still be smoldering from the bombardment it had endured the previous evening. Closer to Nunen, we catch a glimpse of the road that Easy Company took. From this angle, we can see the exact stretch where the lead Sherman was destroyed and most of the company was pinned down. This building here is the Fink farm where part of 2nd platoon took shelter. Note the willow trees along the road. This picture from the 1970s shows the Fink farm from Easy Company's perspective. Again the willow tree is visible having grown over the decades. This picture, taken shortly after the battle and facing in the other direction, shows the destroyed Sherman tank in front of the Fink farm. The wreck has been pushed off the road to make way for traffic. Again the willow tree serves as an identifier. Also note the slightly raised road, the hedgerows and the ditches. These features are all mentioned extensively in the veterans memoirs. Returning to the church tower, 
we get a better view of the west in the next picture. Unfortunately, it doesn't directly overlap with the previous one, leaving us with some blank space on the left. What we can see clearly is the Beck's farm here, where the westernmost panther had taken position. Between it and the road would be the slightly elevated field, but this is hard to see from this angle. The center panther stood in the front yard of the Van Bakel residence, which unfortunately falls just outside this picture. Only the edge of the roof can be seen here. Webster wrote that the tank was driving backwards and forwards out from behind a building, so its hull was likely facing east down the side street, while its turret was turned right to look down the main road. Swinging directly south for the next photograph, we can get a sense of where the third panther may have been. This dirt road here is the escape route Jan van Bakel's parents took when they were caught in a crossfire. If we trace the source of the fire to the east on the next picture, we can see the old cemetery here, which would be the most likely position of the third tank. All this gives us a reasonable overview of the situation. The final piece of the puzzle is Webster's account of the battle, which is one of the most detailed descriptions available. This is not surprising, as he was an aspiring writer who was actively taking notes of his experiences and questioning people after the events. We now return to Webster where we left him, crawling through the roadside ditch shortly after the shootout with the German half tracks had begun. As the Sherman tanks were finishing off the enemy dismounts, Webster writes that his platoon broke off from the rest of the company and made his way into town without waiting for orders. A little while later, he will write that they were in Nunen without officers. Medical records confirm that his assistant platoon leader, Lieutenant Hudson, was wounded that day, and his platoon leader, Lieutenant Peacock, had a reputation for absence in combat, so it may be the case that this was an improvised push led by the platoon's NCOs. Webster writes that they crawled through the ditches on either side of the road. He was in the left ditch with 1st and 3rd squad, the rest of the platoon was on the right. German fire was apparently still light at this point, as they made it to the southern houses in a matter of minutes. The 1st squad scouts were in the lead and spotted a German panther tank that was peeking down the main road from behind a building. Webster wrote that the tank eased out to see what was going on, then withdrew and eased out again. A German got out of the turret and walked towards them with his hands up. They waved him on, but someone in the rear shot at him and he disappeared. The tank backed away. Based on Webster's description, this is almost certainly the tank that had taken up position in the front yard of the Van Bakel residence. In what would be an amazing coincidence, Jan van Bakel's father had approached a German tank commander earlier that day with the question, Kämpfen Sie hier? Will you be fighting here? To which he received the sharp reply, Ja, we are kämpfen hier. Yes, we will fight here. While it is impossible to confirm, this may have been the same tank commander who tried to surrender to 1st squad mere hours later. Regardless, the tank remained a threat and had to be taken out. No one in 1st platoon carried a bazooka, and despite yelling for one to be brought up from company headquarters, none appeared. Marsh and McCreary, the first squad scouts who had spotted the German tank, ran up to the lead British Sherman that had slowly crept up behind them, likely standing next to the Fink farm where it was later destroyed. According to Webster, they tried to talk the British tank commander into firing through a building to hit the panther, but he refused, stating a lack of orders. This encounter is retold in Band of Brothers, but attributed to their squad leader, Sergeant Martin, instead. The story sounds dubious either way. If this was indeed the German tank that had taken a position at the Van Bakel residence, then it seems disproven by the fact that this building received two direct hits from a tank gun. Either way, the men of 1st platoon decided to bypass the German tank and head further into town. They kicked down doors and went room by room looking for Germans. Quoting Webster, I was so scared I could hardly talk. Crouching low, I ran through the backyards and the empty rooms in search of the enemy. A movement caught my eye, and glancing across the street, I saw a middle-aged man and his wife watching us from a second-story window. Wo sind die deutsche Soldaten? I shouted. 
Where are the German soldiers? Weg, the man replied. Away. They shut the window and disappeared. The bazooka men still hadn't arrived. Wiseman, Pace, Genovec and I kept close together, then separated. I found myself alone in a backyard. An old man watched me from a homemade air raid shelter. Wo sind die deutsche Soldaten? I inquired. Na, he whispered. Zeer na. He shook his head at me, as if to say, get out while you can, the Germans are very near. As Webster made a dash for the next house, a machine gun opened up on him, sending a long burst of bullets snapping over his head. He had likely crossed the east-west side street, putting him in the field of fire of the Panther's hole gunner. The noise of battle intensified around him as more of Easy Company entered the kill zone around the Fink farm. Platoons and squads lost contact as they were driven to ground by the crossfire. Reduced to small teams of a few men, some paratroopers pushed further ahead. They found an enclosed field to the east of the main road that was sheltered from German fire. Quoting Webster again, Now there was a spontaneous movement forward, for the enemy fire was still high and apparently unaimed. We crossed a small park, cut with air raid dugouts, and stopped among the houses on the other side. Three or four of us were together in what was now the front. The British tanks were nowhere near, and there were no officers to tell us what to do. Wiseman, Genovac and I went upstairs and began to shoot in all the windows, ditches and hedgerows ahead. Both Webster and Wiseman were experienced infantrymen. They knew fire was a tool. Even if you did not see the enemy, which you rarely did, you could still keep him suppressed by firing at where you think he is or may want to go. If you give the enemy a chance to fire back, he will pin you down and flank you. Genovec, being a replacement, was hesitant to just start shooting. As Webster fired off a clip from his grand, he yelled at him to do the same, shouting, You never see him, shoot where you think they are. The firefight across the park continued for some time and fluctuated in intensity. It was during a lull in the fighting that Webster had a strange encounter with a local. While he was standing in the backyard, a young Dutchman approached Webster asking for a hand grenade. He said he knew where the Germans were and that he wanted to kill them. Webster handed over one of his grenades and wished him good luck. The young men ran down a ditch out into the fields to their left, then turned north and disappeared. Meanwhile, the Germans had started their counterattack and Webster soon found himself back on the firing line. His small team began to lose fire superiority across the park as more German reinforcements converged on their position. A mortar shell landed in the backyard of the house next to them, and after a few more spotting rounds, the mortars had zeroed in and began creeping through the village, clearing the way for the German infantry. For Webster, it was the signal to retreat. Firing back as we went, we began to leave. Another shell landed across the street, then one came into the yard we had just left. I lingered a moment on the edge of the park and suddenly found myself alone. I got up and ran through the park. A mortar shell burst in a tree behind me and I dove for the narrow opening in a thick hedge that formed the south border of the park. A man's body was blocking the opening. It was Meth. The eager but inexperienced cook who had volunteered to join the combat troops and served as a rifleman in Webster's squad. A mortar shell had torn his right hand off at the wrist. Webster tried to get him moving to the rear, but Meth was in shock, convinced he was about to die. Webster was perplexed by Meth's behavior, to quote, To me, a wound was a blessing, a chance to get out of action. I would have been back with the medics by now. Meth, however, was not a man who had been in action before, and so he looked on things differently. A wound to him was apparently a terrible shock, not a golden opportunity. Webster was desperate to get away. The mortar shells crept closer and closer, and a burst of machine gun fire cut through the hedge above them. The German counterattack was right on their heels. Meth still wouldn't budge, so Webster bandaged what was left of his hand and then ran south, leaving Meth behind. After a frantic dash, Webster linked up with the remnants of his platoon near the Fink farm. On the way he passed a fallen bazooka man from company headquarters who had been killed by the tank he was called on to destroy. 
This was Private Robert Van Klinken, a 24-year-old paratrooper whose family had emigrated from the Netherlands decades earlier. As Webster joined his platoon, he noticed that the elite tanks of B Squadron were still standing in the middle of the road next to the Fink farm. He was just catching his breath when two high-velocity shells flew past and crashed into the Shermans. As we watched from behind the house, two shells came in almost simultaneously and knocked out the first two tanks. The lead one began to smoke. It turned right, ground forward slowly into the ditch and stopped. Its cannon went off with a jolt and the shell screamed into Nunen and exploded against the house. Nobody got out of the tank alive. The hatch of the second popped open, however, and three Englishmen jumped out and ran away. With mortars raining down around them and machine gun fire grazing overhead, the men crawled back through the ditches to Opletten, where the rest of the company and the remaining tanks had set up a defense. It was by now late in the afternoon. Of Webster's third squad, Wiseman and Miller were missing, and the wounded meth had been left behind. Many more were unaccounted for in the other squads. As Webster settled down, he saw John Martin, the leader of First Squad, talking angrily to a British tank commander. Martin wanted the tank to fire on the Noonan church steeple, as this was where the German mortar spotter was believed to be. But according to Webster, the tank commander refused, stating that they weren't allowed to destroy civilian property. Again, the validity of this story is doubtful. Multiple buildings were destroyed in the battle, and the church suffered damage from shellfire. Regardless, the exchange was indicative of the troubled relation between the American paratroopers and British tankers. The Americans, rightly or not, frequently accused the British of being too slow and careful in their actions. Webster, for example, wrote that they pulled out without leveling Noonan, as a good American armored unit would have done, for that is how wars are won not by fighting 50% or 30% or even 85%, but by fighting 100% with every weapon at your command. Learning of Easy Company's setback, Colonel Sink ordered Fox Company with A Squadron of the 44th Royal Tank Regiment to renew the attack. They passed through Easy's lines at Opwetten and then turned north towards the hamlet of Bord with the intent of outflanking the German defenses. At 1700 hours, both companies fruitlessly attacked Nunen again. The Germans had by now solidified their defense and kept the attackers at bay. Webster had little enthusiasm for this second attempt. He stuck close to cover and hid behind a tree for most of the engagement. The attack was called off at 1800 hours as the sun was setting. With cries of joy, Webster wrote, we mounted the tanks and went back to Eindhoven. So ended the battle at Nunen. Webster called the action a mess, and wrote that he had only four-letter words for his hated platoon leader, Lieutenant Peacock. Company commander Winters wrote that they were limping back to town that evening, and that the Germans had administered a tremendous beating to American paratroopers who had started the day fully confident. It was the first time Easy Company had to retreat, and their bloodiest day of Operation Market Garden. Two Sherman tanks of B Squadron were destroyed with losses among the crew, and Easy Company suffered 15 casualties, four of which were fatalities. Six civilians were killed in the fighting, and numerous houses were damaged or destroyed. German losses at Nunen are harder to estimate, but at the very least included the two half-tracks. Easy Company spent the next day, the 21st of September, resting and regrouping in their old position east of Eindhoven. Other units renewed the attack on Nunen, but found it abandoned by the Germans. Some of Webster's optimism returned as he was thoroughly enjoying a day of rest in the countryside. Adding to his good mood was the reappearance of his close friend Wiseman, who had gone missing the previous day. He had been cut off in Nunen by the German counterattack and had hidden in one of the houses overnight. Sergeant Randleman of 2nd Squad had gone through a similar ordeal at the Fink farm. Private Meff was rescued from the hedgerow where Webster had left him. He was still alive thanks to Webster's first aid, but out of the war on account of his missing hand. The only fatality in Webster's squad turned out to be young Private James Miller. The German counterattack had cornered him in a backyard 
where he was killed by a hand grenade. Webster had been concerned about Miller from the start, fearing that he was too quiet and obedient, a disciplined soldier, but not a paratrooper who had to act quickly and independently. As his squadmates were pulling out of Noonan on their own accord, Miller apparently hesitated and was left behind, costing him his life. The good news was that the German brigade was on the retreat. Their attack on the Somme bridge had been repulsed with heavy losses in both men and machines. Five tanks, at least three half-tracks and around 350 men were lost in a day's fighting. On the 21st of September, Fulmaltsa's brigade was pushed back to Helmond by the armored spearhead of 8th Corps, which had finally broken through and was now streaming north to cover the right flank of the corridor, putting an end to any German ambitions to capture Somme. They may not have appreciated it as they were crawling out of Nunen under fire, but Webster and the men of Easy Company had played their part in defeating the German armored brigade by pressuring its southern flank at a critical time. On the other hand, the Germans had succeeded in shutting down the Allied corridor for most of the day. They had held the road under fire and destroyed multiple supply trucks that were desperately needed in the north. If anything, the events on the 20th showed that even a failed attack could cause disastrous delays to a plan as delicate as Operation Market Garden. Viewing these days in the bigger operational picture, it is clear that Market Garden had entered its terminal phase. What started as an ambitious drive into the German heartland had slowed down to a series of positional battles along a thin and vulnerable salient. The lightly armed paratroopers, who had played their part in the opening days, now found themselves caught in an attritional struggle of tanks and artillery that they were ill prepared for. Over in Arnhem, the beleaguered British paratroopers, who had fought so tenaciously to hang on to the bridge over the Rhine River, were finally reduced on the night of the 20th. To the south in Nijmegen, an audacious river crossing by American paratroopers, supported by the tanks of 30th Corps, captured the giant road bridge over the Waal River at roughly the same time. With possession of the bridges flipped, both sides could now rush their armored formations into the wide open farmland between the two rivers. The Germans won this race, and by the time the British tanks set out for Arnhem on the 21st, they found their way blocked once more. Meanwhile in the south, the Germans, who were always thinking big when it came to encirclements, were still eager to sever the corridor at its lowest point. The creeping advance of the British 8th and 12th Corps on the flanks had been contained again, leaving much of the corridor still hanging by a thread. With the hasty armored strike at Somme a failure, the German high command settled for the next best bottleneck, the tiny bridge over the zuid willemsvaart at Vechel. Their chance for a surprise attack was now over. This time, the Germans would rely on overwhelming force from both the east and west to sever the corridor in the jaws of a great pincer. As Easy Company was resting on the evening of the 21st, German commanders were working feverishly through the night to get their forces ready for next day's attack. The 107th Panzerbrigade was absorbed into the much larger Kampfgruppe Walter, furnishing it with the additional infantry and artillery support needed for the attack. A great battle for control of the corridor was brewing, one that would see American paratroopers fighting in all directions, north, east, south and west. Webster didn't know it yet, but he was enjoying his last quiet night for a long while. The 20th of September was a dark day for the men of Easy Company and the 44th Royal Tank Regiment who were supporting them. They were repulsed from the village of Nunen and suffered multiple fatal casualties. The fallen of the day are now honored by this monument, which is located next to the appropriately named Bevrijdingsplein or Liberation Square. The 20th may have been a dark day for Easy Company, but we now know that for Operation Market Garden the worst was yet to come. This has been our second episode of a three-part series where we follow in Private Webster's footsteps during Operation Market Garden. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in our third and final episode.